Hello everyone, my name is Pepsilk and welcome to Thoughts On. This is a series where I analyze games and give my opinions on them. Today, we'll be looking at The Evil Within, a very interesting game to say the least. Directed by Shinji Mikami, one of the co-creators of Resident Evil, his name alone got me interested to play it as I love the Resident Evil series but had never bothered to check this game out. Needless to say, it was a very interesting experience, maintaining that RE4 formula with shooting and crafting, plenty of variety and a few design decisions that made me question how this game panned out to be because while I think it's a good game, there are a few problems that I have with it and it's worth noting in case you want to get this one. If you enjoyed the video, like and subscribe and notifications turned on for more gaming content. Let's get into it, shall we? You play as Detective Sebastian Castellanos, who gets called to a mass murder at Beacon Mental Hospital, alongside his group Connolly, Joseph and junior detective Kidman. Seeing it as another day in the office in the world of crime, they find a doctor on the floor and Sebastian checks the cameras to see if he can learn more. After seeing a person teleport and kill three cops in the blink of an eye, he gets injected by the same person and wakes up in the slaughterhouse, where the game truly begins. The game seemingly takes place in a nightmare realm of sorts as the game plunges the player into many different environments and locations. Sebastian's first enemy is a man with a chainsaw. Unarmed and helpless, he takes a hit to the leg and makes his way to the elevator heading down the floor where the three cops got killed and finds Connolly and his team in an ambulance, with the entire city coming down in what is one of the best scenes in the entire game? The cinematography is just beautiful and does a really good job of capturing the city being destroyed as, as if it's something out of the movie 2012. After crashing, Sebastian wakes up in a forest with everyone missing from the crash. Desperate for answers, he makes his way through the forest and first finds Connolly who turns into a monster and is forced to kill him. He then finds the doctor or Jimenez who is looking for this kid that was in the ambulance whose name is Leslie. The doctor's reasons are unknown other than him being important to whatever is going on here. An interesting feature that I wanted to point out is this moment in the mission where this woman barges out of the house and as she dies her body just disappears. This is the first time where I realized that the world we're in is not real as bodies don't just go away out of the blue as we die. You could treat this as a game design thing or a save game space or whatever, but in terms of the game, there is something more going on here. Continuing on, the hooded figure is seen once again and the doctor knows who he is. His name is Ruvik and they have a history together, being former colleagues and involved in a big project intended to reshape reality. Sebastian reunites with Joseph but finds out he is suffering a similar problem to Connolly transforming into a monster. He does his very best to resist the transformation and it works, although Sebastian is worried that he may have to kill him any minute. Unfortunately, I do not have footage for the next part, but Joseph and Sebastian fight Kidman in a water contraption of sorts and they kill a bunch of creatures and free her from it. They're together for a short period of time before being separated once again. Sebastian learns about the story of Ruvik or Ruben Victoriano, an intellectually gifted but mentally unstable child who grew close to his sister Laura. He came from a wealthy family and the residents around the area didn't take that too kindly. So in an attempt to get revenge, they started a fire at the barn where Ruvik and his sister happened to be playing in. As the two become aware of the smoke and flames, they try to escape but Laura couldn't make it up and thus sacrifices her life to save his brother. Ruvik survives but is severely burned from the fire and as a result of this, Ruvik's father hid him in the basement of the family manor that you stumble into when you're chasing Leslie and Jimenez. Traumatized and wanting revenge for himself, Ruvik killed both of his parents, took their money and used it to fund Beacon Mental Hospital, exchanged for test subjects and decided to continue his work of studying the human psyche. Sebastian then learns about Ruvik's project, which is called STEM, a way of changing reality. Ruvik created this to be able to go back in time and live his life again with his sister. 
Unfortunately, Jimenez learnt about this and sold his project to Mobius, who wished to use it for their own purposes. Ruvik didn't take this lightly and is once again being plotted on, but this time not for revenge, so he calibrated it to only work with his brain, meaning that anyone that goes into STEM is at huge risk. Remember the scared kid, Leslie? Who turns out to be compatible with Ruvik's brain as his brain is a blank slate, which means that if he was to plug in alongside Ruvik, they'd be able to power STEM together and use it to create a world of their own. Jimenez tries to use Leslie to return to reality, but soon finds out about the outcome I just mentioned and gets stomped on by one of Ruby's creations. I thought his death was pretty funny. The group once again gets scattered as a result of Ruby's fractured mind and later on linked up again, with Kidman finding Leslie first. She was going to shoot him to prevent him from being used as a host, but Sebastian and Joseph intervene, so she shoots Joseph and they separate once again. All the times they separate in the game is a result of Ruby's brain given his mental stability and fractured mind. I always thought about it as him trying to put the pieces together since he wants to go back and save his sister, but the others are like his obstacles who can't seem to get out of the way. Sebastian finds Leslie and guides him back to the hospital, where he reaches a lighthouse and finds his own body hooked into the STEM machine before finding Kidman and Leslie again, only this time Leslie gets absorbed by Ruvik. In what is a cool and interesting boss fight, you fight inside of Ruvik's brain with this creature being one alongside him. You kill the creature, crush Ruvik's brain to stop the nightmare for good, then wake up inside of a tub once again, with bodies of your fellow comrades, all dead except for you. Kidman tells you to keep quiet about the whole situation, and the game just ends like that after seeing Leslie walk out of the hospital, as if you're still in the same reality you just left, since no one saw him walk out. It could have been a hallucination or a side effect from being in STEM. The game's story is a bit of a weird one, because I didn't understand what was going on when I first stepped into the evil within. I had to watch a video after finishing the game just to understand what was going on, and from the way the game ended, it seemed that a sequel was in play, which would end up being The Evil Within 2. It's both confusing but interesting, and I enjoyed it, even if it was trippy and odd at times. I guess that's Shinji Mikami's genius being put to work. I may as well talk about the characters while we're here too. I thought the characters were lifeless, one-dimensional, and boring, outside of the characters trying to survive and escape this world. I don't think Sebastian here is the best protagonist, Seeing that there's no emotional weight or loss added to him outside of those diaries you find when you go to each of those red rooms where it details his life. I just wish there was something to root for here, but there just isn't. And his voice actor doesn't do it justice either. Something I got so accustomed to and noticing as I went into Evil Within 2 because he was spot on there, saying lines with emotion and meaning. I also think Kidman's voice actor who I learned is Jennifer Carpenter, who's in Dexter, and I did not like her voice at all. She sounded horrible. Kind of like how people shit on Ada's voice actor in RE4, but worse. She never sounds scared or bothered at all by what's going on, and it seems like she put little effort into her lines. She also got replaced by another voice actor in Evil Within 2 and sounds miles better. Joseph was probably the coolest character out of the bunch because of the amount of beatings that guy took. I mean, his death is so funny because prior to him dying, he got shot in the stomach and had to get patched up, then when they separate and see each other again, he gets shot by Kidman and dies then and there. Like, all these beatings and resisting transformations just for him to die in one shot. It's so anticlimactic. With Shinji Mikami taking the reins of the evil with him, the gameplay loop for the most part here is good, maintaining the RE4 formula that he worked on while also bringing a few new things to the table. There are also a few problems that I have, but we'll start with the positives first. The Agony Crossbow is one of the coolest additions I've seen in the survival horror, which lets you craft different arrows such as Freeze, Flash, Explosive, Shock, and Harpoons. Each has different effects and opens up opportunities, such as being able to sneak kill from anywhere whenever you flash a creature, or freezing an enemy still for a short duration which, if you punch them while they're frozen, they'll break into pieces of ice. This is very handy against bigger and stronger enemy types, and each of these arrows have a crafting cost of tools, which you can find from disarming traps spread throughout the game. I relied on flash balls for most of the game because they're cheap to make and sneak kills help to save ammo. Evil Within also gives the player plenty of options on how you explore and navigate the game's levels, having the choice to go either stealth or combat. Most survival horror games usually opt for one over the other, and it's nice to have a change of pace, switching between the two depending on the situation. Weapon variety is good with the usual choice of weapons, and you can also throw items to distract enemies. Now onto the problems that I have, which correlate with three things. Ammo conservation, upgrade system, and having to kill enemies to get loot. Ammo in survival horror games are essential to success as it not only helps you fight back against whatever it is you're fighting, but it's the feeling of having it available to you at all times, especially during points where your ammo is limited due to using your bullets to kill that one hard enemy or maybe you just miss some shots. Most of the time this happens, you usually end up coming out on top, 
or you just decide to run away and save your ammo for when you need it the most. In Evil Within, however, this is not the case. 80% of my first playthrough was me barely having any ammo to scrape by, having upwards of 2 if not 3 bullets maximum on each of my weapons. So most of the combat sections I usually end up with nothing and have to explore while I'm fighting to find ammo. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but what makes it bad is that this is occurring for almost all of the game. And this leads to my second problem, the upgrade system, which is subpar at best, sporting useless upgrades and decent character upgrades except for the melee damage one. That one is a freaking joke and should never be taken because it only affects the damage that Sebastian does when he uses his fists, when even at max it's laughably weak. The weapon upgrades go from damage to accuracy, clip size, reload speed and critical, which gives you a chance to instantly kill an enemy. The system is subpar because combined with the ammo problem this game has, you won't be able to show the true powers of your weapons, making these upgrades redundant and a waste of time to get. If anything, I say the critical one is worth getting because getting that instant kill is better than spending 5 bullets to kill one enemy. And this leads to my third and final problem which is having to kill enemies in order to get loot. The game is very stingy when it comes to loot drops, so if you want to have the best chance of success, you have to kill enemies by any means necessary. While their drops are also piss poor, it's the best way to get items on top of finding things so you can at least keep your inventory healthy, and they can drop anything as well, from ammo to heals. Combine all these together, and what you have here is a questionable and mixed bag of gameplay, having to strive for ammo and kill everything in sight to obtain as much as you can. Resident Evil 7 has less emphasis on ammo in comparison to Resident Evil 8, and even that gives you more ammo and chances to fight back than Evil Within. I think if a crafting system was in play for ammo as well and not just the bolts, it would help remedy this problem. Good thing they added that in the second one. Another cool thing to mention that I didn't say before are the safe havens, which are these red doors that you find throughout the game, and by looking into these bright mirrors, you get transported into a mental hospital which acts as both a save point and a way of upgrading Sebastian. There's also these keys that you find which open storage safes and contain useful items such as green gel, the resource you use to upgrade, and ammunition. There are several bonuses for completing the game as well, such as new difficulty modes, character models, bios, new game plus, and some new weapons if you do a few activities. Good luck to anyone who wants to complete the game on a Kumu where one hit equals death. The level design of Evil Within is fairly linear, with chapters and break moments in between each of the game's levels. I personally don't like the way it's handled here, as seeing loading screens after completing each chapter and seeing the games of the chapters alone kind of ruins the immersion for me. In most survival horror games, it usually takes you through the experience without any sort of loading screen, like RE2 with its PlayStation backtracking, or Outlast with the Mental Asylum. I feel that in these sorts of games, any sort of loading screen or knowing what a chapter is ruins the vibe of what these games are supposed to be known for. Although, there is a bit of non-linearity in some sections whenever you use stealth. For the most part though, most playthroughs would probably be the same, and it's a shame. I would have loved to see some sort of travel system like how Dead Space Remake does it, where you are able to seamlessly travel to every section of the Ishimura, providing you've discovered it, without needing to await the next chapter to go to a new locale. Given that you go through a lot of locations in this game, it would have been cool to see if you can manipulate Rubik's brain in some sort of way. Thankfully, this issue got addressed in the sequel by giving the game a semi-open world which I think suits the game a lot better and gives players more choice in different playthroughs. My favourite level of the game would have to be Chapter 12, The Ride, where you're driving a bus through the city while also fighting a boss named Heresy, who's a spider that spawns these maggots and it's just really cool to look at. I like driving sections and escapes like these in games. I also loved Chapter 9, The Cruelest Intentions, where you learn about the origins of Ruvik and the experiments, easily the most lore detailed chapter in the game. There's very little puzzle solving too, something I expected to see with a game like this, given that Shinji worked on it, and the boss fights are cool with some frustrating ones. For me, it was the Amalgam, which I spent an hour fighting because I had very little ammo and supplies, but I also kept dying over and over to the point where I wanted to give up. After searching him up and learning that you can stealth this fight by sneaking behind the pillars and staying out of his line of sight, the fight became piss easy and it was a matter of sniping and shooting bolts at him from afar until he died. There's plenty of enemy variety here, from invisible monsters to two-headed creatures, a guy that reminds me of Pyramid Head but instead with a safe, shriekers, dudes with chainsaws, the list goes on and i got to appreciate Tango Gameworks for putting all these enemy types. My favourite is the safe head guys, or keepers as they're called, who regenerate by simply fighting another safe and are so cool to look at. You can really see the Silent Hill inspiration from the way they dress and look. They also served as the inspiration for the entire game's look. One thing that I think is worth noting is that the game starts off in a letterbox as opposed to full screen, showing black boxes on the top and bottom. I believe it was intentional to make the game more cinematic, but honestly, it just blocks out most of the screen and I'd rather have that off than it be a detriment. Thank god you can disable it in the settings. 
The camera in this game is pretty stiff too, with a questionable ADS view where you zoom so close to the screen that it's like trying to take a photo on your phone from afar because you can't see it from the view you're in. I mean, look at this. You can barely see the tip of your gun when you're aiming down and it's just so awkward. I don't know what the reasoning would be behind this remarkable design decision other than being able to see more. The game looks really good for the id Tech 3 engine and its time, oozing with atmosphere, fear and darkness. I really like it when you head back to the destroyed city and see it all broken down. Like I said, straight out of the 2012 movie. I like the VHS sort of look it's going for given the film grain and lighting effects that are being used to keep it cinematic. Sort of how the piss filter was being used in the 7th generation of games to make everything look realistic. At least, that's how it looked to me. I've heard of personal complaints within the Steam reviews of Evil Within, but from personal experience on my modern rig with an RTX 3080, I didn't have a single crash throughout playing the game or any black screens. No bugs or anything out of the ordinary from my first playthrough too. The OSC of this game is nice too, with good sound effects. I didn't end up playing the DLCs as I wanted to move on to the Evil Within 2 right afterwards, but two of the DLCs let you play as Kidman from her perspective during the events of Evil Within, and a DLC lets you play as a Keeper in first person. The Evil Within can be described as a theme park of horror. You never know what you're going to get and you have no idea what to expect. While it does have its issues, it's still a good game and I highly recommend getting this one on a sale. It does go on sale very often and it's in a bundle where you can get the DLCs with it as well. It's good survival horror and even though there are better options out there like the Resident Evil remakes or the newer games, this is still worth playing. Just remember the co-creator of Resident Evil worked on this. If you made it to the end of the video, thanks for watching. If I missed anything, comment down below. I'll have more coming to you soon. Peace.